Good morning, everybody, or good evening, or wherever time zone you're in. Uh, here in Redmond, it is morning, it's Thursday, and it's time for another episode of the Visual Studio Remote Office Hours. Um, so since last week, uh, we had a few updates here, or I had a few updates to my home office. Look at this thing. I got like this microphone arm. It's a very cheap one, <laughs> It's, but it does the trick. And here's a really cool thing. So when I'm not doing my video recording or doing meetings, I'll do this. And it's gone and you can still hear me if I yell, right? Very cool. This is probably the thing I've been most excited about uh, because it uh, makes the quality so much better of my voice. Super happy about that. Here's another thing. I forgot my pen. This is the Surface Pen. I forgot that in the office and I went in the other day to pick it up. I found myself doing way more screenshots now than I kind of ever had because I can no longer just show my screen to a colleague. I had to do a screenshot and send it to them often. And so I do a single click with this on the top here and that makes my screen into the screen capture mode. And then I can just, you know, outline what I want to screen sh uh, share and it automatically copies it to my clipboard. So that's really cool. Um, so th the same thing happens if you don't have a pen, Windows Shift S, you can try it now on Windows 10. That will do bring you into like a screen snipping mode. Anyway, so that was a few updates on the home office. Um, this is going to be the last time you're going to see the basketball hoop. I'm going to move that out. So I'm sorry for everyone who's been uh, eager for, to see me uh, try to dunk a ball in that. Not, not happening. Um, all right. So that was an update on that. Today, we have a fantastic show because we are getting a rare insight into how our internal customer research on the, Visual, on the Visual Studio team takes place. We have labs, we have interviews, we have surveys, we have a bunch of things that we do. And typically it's the program managers such as myself and others that uh, talk to customers and, and, and learn things. Um, and all of this goes under the umbrella term customer research, I think. And um, here to talk about that, we have Mr. Research himself. Carl, welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're being generous. Well, first of all, thank you for welcoming you, me into your garage. Yeah, I mean, I feel privileged. You know, it's like not many people get to, you know, be part of this. So, so, so thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> I, don't, so, I wonder, so, Carl, yeah. before, we, before we get into sort of the meat of the matter, mm -hmm. you've been at Microsoft for many years. And mm -hmm. um, so if you would mind introducing yourself to everybody here. Sure. OK, yeah, I, I've been uh, I'm the old timer now, I guess, at this point. So I've seen sort of the changes in how we engage with customers from over the years. And so but yeah, my title is UX researcher um, and my job is to well, a great way of thinking about it is to, to help us as an organization figure out what is the right thing to build and how to build it right. So the first half is about what do customers really need and trying to unveil that onion to try to figure out what is the really core problem that we need to solve and the second part is you know you can think about it as the usability part of it the you know the utility part of it how do we uh, uh, make that um, usable not only from the discoverability part but also from that day-to-day -day usage part right that sort of I'm working the editor and it has to work smoothly for me. So so um, I'm, I'm helping the organization figure out those two halves of that equation. So um, yeah. anything else you want to know about me? I, I was an old C programmer uh, way back when, did image processing stuff, sort of discovered human computer interaction by accident. And I had a degree in uh, medical computer science and did this, uh, research at a cellular level for many years. And so then I just figured, hey, we're multicellular creatures. So I'll take that skill set and just translate it to us. And it seemed to have worked OK. So That's very cool. I think, wasn't it Bill Gates who, when he was asked the question, what he would do if he wasn't into computers, he said he would be in like biotech. And there he is. <laughs> so, that's the, so that's the opposite, maybe, of you. You came from maybe, maybe, that world. exactly, exactly. So, so I guess maybe it's always uh, more interesting the other side of the fence. I guess so. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we we're using basically your team is sort of one that facilitates um, 
the various product teams around Visual Studio. I think a lot of people maybe are not aware of this, but we have typically the way we're um, organized within Visual Studio is that we have a bunch of product teams, we call them, or feature mm -hmm. crews. And they're basically usually at 1 p.m. and about five to seven engineers, and that includes the engineering lead. Mm -hmm. um, and they work on different things. So there is one of those teams. I used to be on one that did Visual Studio extensibility. There is one for the editors. There is one for source control for the Git integration mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And they all like, of course, work together between those teams, but also they are they are sort of their own unit at the same time. And they each come to you, right? And they say, Carl, I'm going to build this feature or I've heard about this problem. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? Is, is that how it's is that how it starts? Very often it does. Um, uh, there is also that um, we're not quite aware of the problem that we have yet, right? We we think it's a problem, and but we don't understand what is really going on here. So we want to sort of really like have people use this stuff and see this stuff and try it out for us to figure out what is really going on here. So. Um, you know, it, it's it's some cases the, the the trigger is not a feature, but rather, you know, we we have these students coming up to Visual Studio, and um, they're installing it, and not running Visual Studio. What is going on here? And that's where I bring in the sort of the the the, the techniques to 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 get into that deeper level of understanding as to why and what and who and where and all that fun stuff. So so that's where I come into play. So it starts at different places. It sometimes it's an idea that somebody has, you know, would customers want this? Right? You know, I had a in other cases it's like, what the heck is going on here? So it could it can come from many different directions. Okay. So you you said something that grabbed my attention. You said that some people or students or whatever would install Visual Studio, but then they would never run it. Exactly. That, how, how did how did you figure that out? What's the reason behind that? Wow. Okay. That uh, you know, uh, great, great question. So so uh, yeah, you know, it had us you know flummoxed, right? I mean, you know, when you ran the numbers and looked at, you know, you're going, you just spent all that time installing Visual Studio. Why not running it? Why not run it? Well. What we did is we then brought a bunch of uh, CS students, in fact, into the lab. Many of them were from the UW because it's close by. And um, had them, we, we basically gave them the browser and said, hey, you know, somebody said, you know, Visual Studio might be an interesting product for you. Why don't you go take a look at it? And we simply watched them, right? Now, what was interesting about it is at some point, you know, through the installation process, all us folks who know Visual Studio know it takes a fair amount of time to install. And it's gotten a lot better over the years, but it's still, you know, uh, the youth today kind of think about it as a five minute. Yeah, ask any college student how long it should take to install a, a tool, they will say five minutes. And well, um, what happened was they would in start installing it, and after about three minutes, they started getting twitchy, expecting it to, you know, be done soon. And then at some point, you know, they're on the internet looking at pictures of dogs and cats because they're like just waiting for it to install. And they're almost like they, they they've sort of forgotten about Visual Studio at that point. And so that's like one explanation for that. But it was sort of intriguing to watch that in the lab, watching people have that experience and not only seeing their expectations, but actually seeing when they start getting bored because you could see it in their face. You can see it in their attitude. You can see it in their physical mannerisms as they're installing Visual Studio. So so what do they do? Do they reach for their phone at that point? No, they, 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 we, you know, they're kind of stuck in the lab, right? They're waiting for this thing to install and they get bored and they start going to the internet and looking at other things. And that led actually to, to some inspiration and said, can we keep their attention while they're installing Visual Studio? Can we give them some upfront um, insights into how to use Visual Studio while they're waiting? 
to not only really occupy their time, but almost more importantly, that when they first start Visual Studio, they kind of already know what to do. They already have a notion of what is a solution and a project and how to you know, pick the first template and do sort of those basic things to do Hello World, for example, right? And what we discovered is if we can get them that, you know, almost um, sort of a visual tutorial that they can explore before that, they were far more successful when they first opened Visual Studio. So that was one of those deeper learnings that we had along the way. That makes sense. And it, that's kind of funny that I didn't know that came from there because it's something we talked about for well over a year, maybe two years, right? About having something make the make the installation process a bit a little bit more interesting or engaging somehow. Yeah. Yep. So that yep. all came from that research you did back then, I guess. Yeah, there was sort of uh, there were several deeper learnings around that too. Uh, for example, uh, people don't want to read a whole lot of text. We kind of know that, right? But when you see it, when you see people skimming, it sort of really brings home the point that um, you really need to be very crisp in your communication. And the other thing that was sort of real interesting is when you want to learn how to do something, a little animated GIF, right, uh, that shows you where you need to go, instead of reading like two, three paragraphs, you know, do this, go to this menu and hit that drop down and da 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 da, a little animated GIF was something that people really gravitated towards because they could see it in action, you know, and it was kind of small, but it kind of gave them the general place to start. And that just proved to be very, very effective. You do need to think about how to do those animated GIFs because they can be pretty poorly done also. If it's too small, you can't really see very well. So you have to think about it a little bit, but uh, very effective if you get it right. Okay, so we have a question here from, um the Q&A asking, if I turn off the telemetry, will I then show up as having installed the product but never run it? So in other words, are these numbers real or could they be a consequence of people disabling telemetry? Uh, that I don't know. Um, you know, you, you should definitely talk to Kathy about this one uh, because she did a, that a, a initial body of research and did that. Uh, instrumentation work, so you would need to ask her about that. That I don't know for sure. All right. You know, um, I should ask her. That's a good. That's a really good question, actually. I like. It that. is a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have a way of bringing people into a lab. We literally have a lab in one of the buildings. Is it building sixteen? Uh, it is. Yes, it is building sixteen. And it's it a it's 16. a full on lab where people come in and sit down and. You take them through tasks, and how does that how does that process work? You want me to show you some pictures? Yeah, let's see them. All right, all right. So I'll go show screen and then pop through pictures. And so so I'll just kind of bring up PowerPoint. I'll show full screen here, share the full screen, and then let me know when you all can see it. Is that okay? Can you see that okay? Here we go. Yep, it we see through? it. Yeah, it's coming through. Okay. Well, I'll show you the the cleaned up pictures when we first built it, all the shiny ones, right? Before it actually got messy and 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 where where things got busy. So uh, basically, there's a big old garage door. We can open it up, make it very inviting, uh, and uh, there's sort of this shared space here. And, and you see the labs around it. And the goal was to create almost a, a design space, a maker space. So we can uh, surround ourselves with, you know, um, our customers experiencing these ideas, these, you know, these, these new products, these new features, and to sort of start brainstorming about solutions to some of the problems we're seeing in a space that makes it very, very uh, collaborative. I should say, and that's why you see these screens up on the side here. Um, I'll show you a few more pictures where what's happening is you're actually seeing inside the lab. You're seeing the customer engage with the product, trying to figure it out, trying to use it for the first time or using a new version of it that we've changed and tweaked in some meaningful way. And we're trying to investigate if, if that's a useful change or not. Uh, the individual. Uh, uh, place. This is sort of looking at it from 
um, the team's perspective on the side. This is the place, the side that we work. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of us in action. And what you'll see, and the users on the other side of that mirror, it's a one-way mirror actually. And um, the purpose of that is that we want to not bias that customer in any sort of way. So we want them to go in there and have some task to do and for them to go at it and for us to watch to see what happens without sort of interfering uh, or being very deliberate when we need to jump in. Um, so uh, this is sort of pictures from a typical Thursday. One of the things that we do in the lab is basically these teams, these individual teams that you just spoke about earlier, um, uh, develop a cadence and so very often Thursdays are a really big day and it happens on other days of the week too but uh, what happens is on a Monday we figure out what we want to bring into the lab in front of customers and it could be like I said an idea or it could be um, you know something that is where we're tuning and when we just pre-schedule these customers every week so every thursday we know that every team i'm going to have customers in front of me and and i can go explore ideas i can do um you know it could be just a standard sort of usability thing or it could be a mock-up of some idea that we want to find out if it has legs if it has if it's a meaningful change for our customers if it can fit into their workflow and work style in a meaningful way so, so that every week gives us that cadence, that constant stream where always got users around us. You know, some other pictures around that. This is again, the team in this design space. Um, you know, we're absorbing what we're, what, what we're hearing and what we're seeing. And I think that's an important point here too, in that we're not only listening to customers, we're watching how they're doing stuff and looking at the two together, right? What people, C is is really useful. Sometimes what people don't see is equally important, right? And especially when you talk about discoverability of things. And so what people don't notice, they can't tell us about, but we can see them not noticing it. And last week you talked a little bit about the eye tracker and stuff like that. So we even have to sort of when when appropriate, be able to put an eye tracker to see what they're not looking at, to see what what part of the UI um, they're missing that we need to somehow bolster up in some meaningful way. So, so is that, am I, this is, I do want to stop is, for a moment. Yeah, I have a follow-up question here. Oh, you so, do, all right, yes. Right, right, so, um, so this is amazing. This is like, this is a proper lab, right? You do actually proper testing here. This is significant and you bring, I think I saw a number like, a while ago saying that you run like 10,000 people through customer research a year or something like that. Like that's a, uh, that's a staggering amount of people. It's a staggering, but that 10,000 also reflects other things, not just the lab, right? So what we look at, um, you know, as you know, we've had, um, if you think about how we did our job 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? Where, you know, there were specs, right? to agile, to lean, uh, such that um, uh, we all are, you know, the lab is just one space, right? It's just one place where customer engagement happens. It's, it's convenient for many folks because it creates a cadence, it creates uh, a healthy forum for having that conversation. Um, but we have interviews. Um, uh, hopefully, some of of the audience have participated in this, where we will uh, remotely share with you stuff and ask for your feedback. And so, you know, when you think about that ten thousand, it really encompasses all those what we call zero distance touch points, mm -hmm. which is still massive. When you think about ten thousand direct customer engagements, right? That's a big number. Um, and it's an amazing number and uh, right. it was an amazing, it was so amazing that Satya came about a year and a half ago and was quite awestruck by the whole experience and seeing how much we do. No wonder it's, it's, 
ten thousand is is just a gigantic number. But it's it, it, yeah. The obvious question then is, how do you find ten thousand people uh, that are I assume <laughs> that are not that are different? They can't be the same people every time, or maybe that's okay. Like how do you how do you go about that? That that is great. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, and that's a great segue too when we talk about the lab is well you know the world is not Redmond and Seattle, and so the lab is where people physically come in. But uh, again, we reach out remotely, um, and uh, we have a number of different ways of, engage, of, 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 of connecting with customers. So for example, we have an organization that will recruit for us. They will reach out to folks and ask them to participate. We'll give them a profile, and they will seek out, contact those folks, and ask them if they can participate for you know, a 45-minute hour uh, lab sessions typically are like an hour and a half because we will do multiple different things. For instance, if we are testing APIs, um, we're um, and we 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 can test APIs for uh, usability, for example, and do it in an iterative sort of way. And so, you know, coding takes a little bit, so they're in for an hour and a half. But um, and then there are services out there that actually allow us to do these little mini usability studies and little little studies that are like 15 minutes long and they will then we create a screener and then it goes out to the world and people sign up to participate and um, and do these little mini studies so there's all kinds of different venues by which we do that and then of course conferences right and um, in fact let me show you a build from the one of the conferences. Yeah, okay. Uh, build, <laughs> unfortunately, is remote this year. Uh, well, it's going to be interesting, right? But uh, uh, anybody who's attended Build will recognize this because um, at Build, we sort of turned around the story where normally, you know, we're, we're typically it's about downloading stuff to our customers. Here, it's reversing it, it's about uploading for our customers telling us telling us their story, telling us about issues, and us taking that back to the lab. So again, there is sort of many, many different venues to reach that 10,000 number. And, uh, you know, last year we had this wall of people submitting um, uh, uh, sort of feedback to us, direct feedback in a very, very structured way. And even in some cases adding pictures. And that wall just, took over. I mean, we had six just there on that one wall. We had 660 people having given us um, uh, very targeted information about the product, what they like, what they don't like, what they see as an improvement to it. I remember that. I thought that was such a powerful thing. So what what Carl and team did was that they in building 18 where the Visual Studio team uh, are on the second floor. There was there, there's this big long wall down a corridor, um, and you basically just completely covered it in tiny little pieces of paper that each represented the story of a user. Mm -hmm. And so that was a handwritten, I think, their handwriting, maybe even. Yeah. Uh, and just going through, and you categorized them. Some of it was about the setup experience, some was about editor experience, or something like that. They were like categorized in different things. And mm -hmm. so we could, as PMs, we could go down or anyone, engineers and whatnot, we could see and we could follow and we could learn uh, firsthand from a direct feeling that users have engaging with the product or a frustration or something they're really happy about. Because right. I think oftentimes it's, it's easy to just focus on things that are problems that we have to fix in the product. But mm -hmm. many times we also have to identify, well, what are the things that work really well? Let's make sure we don't screw those up. Right, right, right. Um, that, was, that was more yeah. of that. That was, that, was really one, that was one thing that, that stuck out. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one thing that I thought that wasn't the most hilarious thing ever. Uh, there was a guy, I think, he was <laughs> very unhappy, very yeah. unhappy that we changed the logo. Yes. Do, you remember, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I still have it. Can uh, you, uh, you can you talk about what he what he did? So so so. Um, in years past, uh, we would have these sort of, you know, feedback walls and people would scribble on, you know, uh, a sticky and maybe put their picture on it. And it was sort of um, 
uh, loosely formed and, and it proved to be very hard for us to get it back to the teams, right? Who does this belong to? If somebody says, oh, performance not so great, well, who do you bring that to, right? Because very often performance is specific to an activity. It's, a, it's specific to, you know, something. And, and uh, what happened there was we put some structure on it and we have something called the hypothesis framework where everybody builds these hypotheses and we have sort of a Mad Lib style fill in the blank kind of moment where we said, as this type of developer who does this kind of work, my problem is this. And because, and when you fill in that stuff, it gives it is just a much richer venue of information for us to then get that back to the teams, to the proper people in the teams to really understand the source of that anxiety or that design idea. What happened there is here, see, he, he, his thing is as a long term Visual Studio user who um, tat, who's a tattoo lover. Um, you know, you have changed the icon and he had the original logo on a Visual Studio on his arm and he kind of and in the picture he shows the <laughs> the original logo. And so so uh, jokingly he was sort of describing his pain point of us, us changing the Visual Studio logo and this imprinted <laughs> tattoo on his arm is no longer uh, current. So so it was so funny. So we so, so awesome. when we when we talk about like hey this has consequences if we if we if we build one feature over another or we don't fix that bug because we instead use the time to fix a bug somewhere else mm -hmm. like it has consequences but never like a consequence like that that <laughs> was just from unique. left field yeah that was yeah yeah that but you know the other thing I think it's it's important here to talk about is that um and you know especially in these times now it's like um you know the 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 how important you know a product like visual studio is to our customers right and how yeah. important it is for us to uh be very very thoughtful in what we change what we add into visual studio um how we think about it right and so so clearly you know it, it's it's it, it's something when you have to live in it you know four five eight ten hours a day it becomes something that's very personal to you and that's important to consider also and this is why these sort of venues are so important and that's why these engagements are so important to us because you know we can't understand all the different contexts there's so many different sort of perspectives that people bring into uh, their daily lives and to create a tool that is able to be able to um, uh, uh, have affordances for those different perspectives and those different skills and those different contexts is, is, is quite challenging. So, Right. And, and it is something we take very seriously, but I think that, like what you're saying, just to echo that, like now with uh, everything going on is even more important, right? That, you know, we we take we take this very seriously because uh, this is now used for like uh, very serious business around the world, right? To to stop these things going on, and so uh, it kind of adds a little bit of pressure, I'd say. <laughs> Just a uh, little, yeah. <laughs> hey, but that's good. Right? It's it's a it's it's a it's a good pressure, and we feel good about like it's being used for good things. And so mm -hmm. um, there's been a really good sense, I think, on the team, like team all up, Julian, Amanda, and all the way down. Um, that we're actually we're we're making a difference, and all the people that use Visual Studio, and of course other uh, programmers using other uh, tools as well, like it's, it's actually making a real difference, keeping the world running right now, mm -hmm. uh, and coming up with algorithms and stuff that can that can, you know, sequence DNAs and come up with cures and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So so that feels very empowering when you think about that. We as a as an industry, as a, as programmers, as developers, and so on, that. Um, even though it doesn't seem like we're doing much, right? We're sitting at home. Um, we're not healthcare workers or anything like that. No, but we make sure their email works, that they can communicate, that they, exactly, you know, all this yeah. sort of. So. Right, exactly, exactly it, yep. So Carl, we have another question here. This is this is a good one. Oh, okay. So you mentioned that we bring new, pe new uh, beginners into test Visual Studio, right? We have them in to see, uh, to run, you know, setup and how we can improve setup by, by studying a new mm -hmm. beginner, Visual Studio users, but what about 
like power users or experts. Like, do we do any studies on them oh. to make sure oh. that any problems they face are also taken good care of? All that, oh no, no. Uh, so, so again, you know, we're very hypothesis driven. In that particular case, we were investigating a, 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 a specific uh, uh, problem. So in the quant data, right, we, we, we found out that these students were, and so that led to that investigation. But uh, in our lab, um, and particularly with the IDE, we have a very broad spectrum of customers coming in. And um, in fact, I would say um, we even uh, had this sort of great experience where we had uh, a developer who was blind come in and uh, use the debugger. And, and it was an amazing experience because the entire dev team showed up for that to understand the accessibility of the debugger in general. And just watching that customer struggle with some things that were just kind of things that we just didn't think about or just kind of overlooked or didn't prioritize correctly. Uh, it, it was a remarkable experience for them and um, a remarkable experience for the product because I think that inspired that entire team to focus in on those issues, learned a lot and uh, really turned around the accessibility of that product. So, so uh, I have many folks, you know, 20 year veterans who will come in. I remember VB6, you know, <laughs> sort of thing, right? And and that actually speaks to, you know, what is really kind of a challenge here is that for any product that you use so much, you develop habits. You develop, you know, you know, you think about just the, the sort of the editor, for example, you know, and how an editor works. It's a big deal. And you you're in a path where you know you do need to make progress you do need to improve on things um, but you need to to also be very cognizant of those patterns of behavior so it becomes um, the challenge is trying to understand uh, how you can augment how can you work within that 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 sort of learned behavior and be able to be able to sort of um, provide uh, additional value in a, in a meaningful sort of way. So yeah, and then, you know, I have folks coming in who, um, you know, have to sort of zoom in the screen, have to increase the font size because, you know, they're in their 50s and, and, and their eyesight is starting to sort of become, you know, challenging. And, um, you know, so it, it really, we, we really sort of invite as many different folks in and we love the diversity, the diversity of people using Visual Studio uh, week to week. You know, that person who comes in, who comes at it from a very different perspective, who, um, you know, offers us that perspective, gives us yet another sort of way of thinking about how we should approach the problems. Yeah, that and that's a really interesting thing um, with habits, right? Because we all do things differently. And, and one way that, I see that very clearly with our users is uh, we have this way of providing feedback. People can send feedback from within Visual Studio, whether it's a bug report or a suggestion ticket, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, what's well, really, really important for one person for us to fix, like this is an extremely important thing for them. That It's the core of their workflow, mm -hmm. but they are, you know, unique in the sense, well, there's not really any unique Visual Studio users. We are too many. We're in the, like what is it, eight, <laughs> eight million or whatever. Yeah. So, so, so re usually when we see that people open a bug saying, "Hey, this this thing doesn't work," we think about it as being thousand people. Like, so one person equals thousand people, mm -hmm. and that is just a number we made up. Um, so, but the the point is that there's a lot of people that have the same problem, but it could still be relatively small compared to the eight million Visual Studio users. And so. It might be something super important to one person, but not to the others. But that doesn't mean that that thing isn't important to that person because they're mm -hmm. doing something oh, yeah, niche, yeah. or their workflow yeah. or their habits have them use the product in a certain way. And and one and one way I think where the the UX lab and, and your team really comes in and, and shed lights on on this sort of stuff is here's a very concrete example. How do you how do you build your solution? Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's probably three ways that I can think of. There might be more. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more. Um, but you can either use a keyboard shortcut. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do that. That's very common. Mm -hmm. But 
when you take people, even people that have used Visual Studio for years through the lab, you learn that a lot of people actually go up to the build top level menu and click the build uh, menu item itself, mm -hmm. or they right click the solution and say build solution from there. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you learn that for the same task, there are multiple ways of doing it. And it's not like one is more correct than the others, but you might have optimized for a certain flow you thought this is how people always do it. You, it never occur, occurred to you that, hey, people do it differently. And so yeah. then you end up with all these bugs and you don't know how to prioritize it necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and we struggle a little bit with that, but that's where the lab really comes in, right? Because you can very clearly see that our uh, assumptions of how people use the product probably aren't the right ones. Right, right. And then it becomes interesting. I'm going to circle a little bit back to the student profile is that so we we sort of view running and 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 um, uh, the bugging as the same thing, right? It's sort of we've conflated the two together and that's uh, there has been a long term sort of visual studio thing. Well, when students come in and they write some code, and they write their hello world code. They look for a run command. And it's not a run command. Right? There is play and 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 there is that little green arrow that looks familiar, but you know, it's about debugging. That doesn't quite make sense. I don't want to debug, I just want to run my code. And you'll watch them for look for a run command <laughs> anywhere in the product. And uh, it, it's sort of, you know, uh, again, going back to what we just talked about, it's sort of, you know, so many different people coming at it from different perspectives and trying to weave that through all that is, 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 is fascinating and challenging and, and, and kind of, you know, it's really hard, but it's hard in a good sort of way. Yeah. So this is a, this, this, this is a good segue, Carl, because now we've been talking about bringing people into the lab. Now, this is something very, very few teams or companies can do, right? Because it's not a cheap thing. We have a whole team dedicated oh, to yeah. running these labs. And, right. and so it's only sort of the big tech companies probably that, that can do that. Mm -hmm. But we do other things for this sort of qualitative information gathering, right? We do... Uh, we do customer interviews where we we Skype them or Microsoft Teams or call them on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And we have that sort of down to a science too, right? It's like there's a certain recipe of how to do it right. There's a lot of stuff we've learned over the years. How do we, how do you conduct a good interview uh, and how do you do a bad one? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, can you, can you talk about like a little bit, how do you, how do you even get started with, with um, doing these interviews and, and, how do you make sure that your own biases doesn't predict the outcome before you even start? Um, mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that, some common pitfalls. Yeah, so I, I, I can, there's multiple parts to your question here. Yes. So, so one is like, uh, what if I'm not a big company, right? I'm part of a small team, right? And I don't have these resources. So that's kind of an interesting question too, right? And then there's, the, how do I do this successfully? How do I remove my own biases from this? Um, and um, uh, and then, then there is sort of that, okay, there is sort of this rich space of um, uh, uh, things you can do to engage with customers. There's all these opportunities there and they're each special in your own way and how you approach it. So this really, your question is really, pretty open. Do you want to pick one of them over the other? Do you want to start with one or, or yeah, what's let's, your... let's start with like if you're not a big tech company, how can you how can you do your own customer research? So one of the things that um, in fact even happened um, um, in the office when we were in the office um, that I had a team who um, we really didn't have resources for them. We really didn't have the ability to resource them. And so and they were dealing with some docking windows issues. And they were trying to understand, you know, if this is going to be intuitive and all this stuff, right? And so instead of sort of going into this large structured sort of approach, I said, follow me. And we walked to another building, another team room, 
And we walked into one of these team rooms and looked around for a dev. And, you know, basically jokingly, you look like a dev. Can we chat with you for about five minutes? And we brought our laptop with us. We had a private build of that feature and we gave him a task to do. Hey, could you do us a favor and try docking these windows? And we just watched this person try to dock these windows. And and we saw and we, we, we would say, try docking it here, try docking it there, try tap, you know, try different. And and suddenly we said, ooh, that did well, that worked great, that not so much so. And we were able to take that very quickly back. And we only had to do that like two, three times. You know, when you see three people in a row having the same problem, you're going, well, you know, there's a chance that this is going to be a big problem for everybody. OK, OK, that makes sense. So right. so was it important then that the person that you uh, interviewed there, I guess, at that time was mm -hmm. uh, was not on the team that built that docking feature? It was someone that had no idea, no prior bias either way. Yeah. Um, so if you were to do this in your own company or mm -hmm. wherever you might work, uh, let's say that your your company you have a you shall sell shoes online, mm -hmm. and so you have a bunch of developers. If you go to them and ask, then they might know uh, the problem if it's a small team. But you can go to someone in accounting that would be a potential customer, right? Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. online but that doesn't know anything about the technical aspects that you're about to ask them about. Right. Would that be would, would that be how you do it? Absolutely, you know, you, you pick shoes, you know, everybody buys shoes, right? <laughs> so is somebody in, in accounting gonna be fundamentally different than somebody in um, delivery around shoes? Well, maybe, right? Uh, maybe not, and so, um, uh, you know, watching somebody try to buy shoes online, if that's the sort of the goal and you're, and, and, the, and you're, and you're working with a new idea, um, and seeing how they use it, it's that simple. Now, the hard part here is for all of us, we talked about bias, right? We talk about bias, you know, you know, internal versus external customer, so on and so on. There's also our own biases. And when you have a feature and somebody struggles with that feature, your first inclination is to do what? Help, right? We're all trained to help, right? We are in our industry, we, 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 we're built to help, right? When we see somebody struggling, we wanna fix that problem. In this case, you have to sort of back away from that and have to let that problem happen. And in your brain, you have to go, if I can understand this problem well, OK, if I can let this problem happen so I can understand it well, then I have half a shot at figuring out how to solve it for a large population of people. That's the hard part. The hard part is like watching somebody struggle and be in pain and be confused and not wanting to jump in. Rather taking the approach of um, uh, letting it happen as it would. And then afterwards, you can help that person. That's not, you know, that's perfectly OK but it's a focus on learning at that moment. You're learning, 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 learning. You're not helping, you're learning. And, and everything you do is about trying to mitigate that biases to maximize that learning. Does that make yeah, sense? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think, so last time you and I worked together was on Visual Studio Code Spaces, and it was about figuring out, we had a bunch of hypotheses of what are, what are some typical customer issues, what are some, problem hypothesis and what are some solution hypotheses and we start calling people like over 50 people we called like an hour yeah. mm -hmm. uh we had an hour with them each mm -hmm. to go through a bunch of things and this was all done on microsoft teams and i remember like a lot of the things that we thought was gonna be validated you know that's a slam dunk our assumption was that everybody here has that particular problem or think that this is a good solution for previously established problem mm -hmm. and it turned out that that was wrong and oftentimes when when those people uh struggled with finding the sort of the solution or identifying the problem or something like that um you know we were like my initial reaction was i wanted to help them get there somehow i wanted mm -hmm. to because they would typically say oh you have a problem with such and there's a problem with visual studio when i do such and such mm -hmm. 
and that's not why you're doing the interview. But I kind of wanted to go in and say, well, have you tried doing this and this instead? Like completely irrelevant to the yeah. what we were doing, right? And and then derailing the conversation and that sort of stuff. But mm -hmm. I just find it so fascinating that we can be so wrong all the time. And then, yeah. um, like, are we? Are we though so wrong? I I think you know um, we all um, you know you think back in in sort of software and 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 the evolution of how we do things and you know the 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 we were in a model where the most knowledgeable person was the person who we would assume to be right um if you are in a a frame where you're really brainstorming you're really engaged you're really sort of um looking for opportunities in many in many different places you better be wrong most of the time right you can't be right there's no way you can be right the world is very very complicated and the real trick here is the faster you can figure out you were wrong right and the faster you could learn from that mistake the better you're going to get at coming up with uh, a solution that um the, the broadest set of people will have the maximum benefit from yeah you want to you want to be able to uh, figure these things out so you can course correct early on before you get too deep into the development cycles, right? And exactly. so you have to back out and re-architect and all that. And, and so a great thing to do at sort of a physical level is what you'll see in the lab is we'll be bringing these low fidelity mock-ups into play where what we do is we show you um, how that experience could feel like if you were to use it, okay? And in some cases, it's a simple sort of what we call user step system response sort of model where you do this, you see this, you do this and this. And then you can do interesting things like what would you do next, which is almost almost like this mini sort of usability thing. Will they know what to do next, you know, if we show them the screen? And, um, you know, it's some cases really easy and simple uh, to create this sort of mock-up. It's literally taking a screenshot, slapping some, you know, MS Paint <laughs> UI on top of it, enough to give the customer a sense of what it could feel like, okay? Yeah. And, and sometimes, very often, that is sufficient to find out that, well, we were, we were smoking something that day because, <laughs> uh, you know, um, and, and, and rip it up and start all over again. But when we start all over again, we go, wow, that didn't work, right? Uh, perf tip uh, tips that I worked on several years ago with a team is a great example of that. The first idea that we had, and this is something that came internally. Um, some higher up people had this notion for this window that would give performance information and it would sort of look like the Windows sort of thing and it shows CPU and memory oh, and stuff. Like the task manager. Yeah, kind of like that. And then as you step through it, this thing would sort of, you know, change. And what we did is really simple is we took a screenshot, we, we did sort of a, a really cheap variation on top of that. We showed you stepping through code and seeing that window. And without explaining anything to them, we asked them, what do you think that thing is? You know, and they would, uh, I think it's something about, you know, my CPU, but, you know, um, um, kind of, I guess it's dealing with, you know, how my memory, da, da, da. Um, but it was all these sort of really vague sort of answers. Mm -hmm. And then we asked it sort of that, there's always a great question to ask. What would you do with that thing? Oh, I'd probably close it, which is going to hit the kids to death, right? If once it's closed, it's not coming back. And so, so because it was a low fidelity mockup, we did this two weeks in a row, couldn't get it to work. We made some changes, see if we can, it failed over and over and over again. Nobody got it. Nobody could articulate how they would use it in, in the real world. And so we basically ripped it up and started all over again. And that led to the perf tip story that we have today, which the goal was to democratize performance. And so that's the feature you see today. Nice. Yeah. Are there any other sort of surprises that you have uh, just observed over the years where we were sure about a certain outcome that then turned out to be different. Are there any 
fun stories from the oh. trenches? <laughs> oh God, there's so many. There's big ones and small ones, and and um, uh, um, where do I start? Um, uh, console app. That's an interesting one. Um, that uh, you know how the console app works if you write your little hello world story so like a .NET console app for instance exactly something yep. simple like that right so so i'm going to circle back to the student story because it just it's top of mind right now for me so um student you know and these are cs these are computer science students right from the U university of washington um and some neighboring schools so really smart people and a lot of them were in their junior level, so already had gone through a full suite of, of, of um, coding classes. And they would be writing their Hello World app just to get a flavor for it. And that was interesting too, because the question that we had is, is Hello World still relevant for you know, new developers, for the people coming in today? Turns out, yeah, it is, you know, but you think about it, it's a concept from the 1960s. You know, it's from Kernighan and Ritchie C programming way back in the 1960s when that notion was introduced, but it seems to be still relevant today. And so they're writing this code and they write this hello world and then they run it. And then the screen will flash and go away. And they're like, What's going on? Now, this is a concept that's been in Visual Studio forever, right? The fact that, you know, you have to stop it. You have to put an input or a breakpoint, something in there in order to break that code from completing its execution. And it's been something that we've just assumed all along. And um, and the, the PM who uh, watched this from week after week, watched these students hitting on the same problem, and they were left in the dark. It would disappear, like, what happened? You know, I tried to run it and nothing happened. And it was only in the in the situation where things are running really, really slow that you kind of saw something appear that looked like, you know, uh, there was something in there that could be your code. And um, and so he took it upon himself to make that change in order to not have it have that window stick around. And so. What was really fun is that he got an email after they uh, um, got it out the door from a, 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 a very senior level, a senior level developer who just loved this new feature because he could take that console app and dock it, put it onto his other screen, and and it stayed there, and it was able to do the work that he needed to do, um, and he loved it, and he for him it was a new feature, right? So that that was a pretty interesting pivot on something that we just all had assumed after years and years and years of this is how it works, right? Oop, are you there? Sorry, I I muted because I have I have painters outside and they have the, this machine that pumps paint. Uh, so so I was muting my phone. Sorry. Uh, so. Um, Let's see here. So what's really cool about what Carl just said there was that the um, there was a uh, test in the lab that was happening about students and how, you know, starting up Visual Studio for the first time uh, was uh, was being perceived by these students. But what's really cool is that the people that were sitting there in that room observing the product team sitting in the room observing all these students they started seeing patterns that they weren't there for. It was just something emerged and they noticed something and they could brainstorm it right then and there and come to uh, basically fix some problems that they didn't even know existed till they had those students in there uh, for completely different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that's a quite frequent thing, I would assume, right, Carl? Yeah, I'm back, by the way. So, so I got kicked. <laughs> no, no, no one noticed but me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well done. So, so I had that moment of panic. Is like, did you even hear what I said? It just kind of stopped. So, so, so. Um, could you repeat the just frame the question for me one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Carl. Um, it's that we had uh, 
the findings that they had figuring out the console lab was sh shutting down if they didn't have a console read read line in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, like they figured that out by just observing people in the lab. They weren't there to test out that scenario. It just happened Sorry. to be a pattern that emerged and then they were able right. to fix something they didn't even know needed fixing. And uh, right. so is that something that happens frequently? Oh yeah, and you know, the thing is when you watch somebody uh, in this case, uh, Augustine was the person who just, it drove him, watching that week to week just drove him nuts. Seeing that stupid thing happen week to week just drove him nuts. Mm -hmm. And it gave him that passion and that ammunition to go, you know, we have to do something about this, right? And it happens all the time because, you know, when you watch somebody struggle with something, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, watching that blind developer struggle with your code, with your app, and for things that you've missed, um, things that you thought about in sort of not quite the right way. You didn't really understand the problem well enough. Um, that's a source of energy. That's a source of inspiration. That's where, that's where you're willing to sort of step it up, right? And that just happens all the time because, well, you know, it's like we all want to help. We all want to fix things, right? It's intrinsic to you know our industry. It's intrinsic to who we are as tech people. And so, so watching and seeing and hearing this stuff is is just powerful. Can't can't shake it. Yep. How are we doing on time? So we're we're good. We got uh, we got four minutes left. And so all right, all right. There's one thing we haven't talked about yet, Carl. And we're unfortunately we're not going to have uh, much time to do, but Okay. Uh, we went through bringing people into a UX lab, which very few people can do. We talked about, hey, you can do interviews with customers like over Teams or Skype or whatever is your preferred method over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, you can sort of interview or have like run throughs of your features with people that are in your vicinity, in your mm -hmm. office, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and we do another thing, which is we do a lot of surveys as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that everyone watching this, you've seen us ask you questions, like whether it's inside Visual Studio or it's on the Visual Studio website somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, even the blog asks you for your feedback. And so, you know, a common fear, of course, is that we ask too much, too many times. <laughs> you we we give you these things, but there's a reason, and there's a method to the madness, right? How does how do these surveys work, and why are they? Why is it important that people answer them if they have the time and the capacity? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, also a great question because there's multiple aspects to it. So, um, so when we uh, learn stuff in the small, like, you know, we're in the lab and we bring in, you know, five, six, 10, 15 people, and we start learning what's the right way of asking the question, what is really the core problem? Then the next thing is, you know, how pervasive is this? Is everybody suffering from this or is this a meh sort of, mo you know, um, is there different types of people that are more affected than others, right? In some cases, some, it's a meh, for other people, it's like the world is coming to an end maybe moment. And so the survey helps us get that breadth perspective. In some cases, we're trying to also, depending on what the hypothesis is, what we're trying to learn, it could be, um, you know, we're trying to say, hey, are we missing the boat here in some fundamental way and getting that input from customers? And who are these people using this in the first place? You know, we, we, we have limited visibility. We have instrumentation and stuff like that. But who you are as a person and what you're trying to accomplish is, is something that is we're trying to make more visible. And these surveys give us that window into that. And so, um, you know, uh, we feel always like, are we um, asking too many surveys? And we, we have some controls in place, as you know, to sort of mitigate that. Um, and so, but yeah, it's a very real sort of issue is, is how do you reach out to all these people to get this feedback? And you don't want to overburden people. And I think, you know, it's still a struggle and it probably will be a struggle for some time until, you know, we all figure out what the right path and rhythm through all this is so but it's yeah. incredibly important for all of us you know anybody who has these questions we're trying to learn and you are our you know your our customers are our you know colleagues and all this and you know learning doesn't happen in isolation it happens in collaboration 
And so this is just another form of collaboration. Yeah, and oftentimes uh, we use the survey because we think there might be something that we're missing the boat on, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out to be true, that could lead to us bringing people in specifically to test out uh, some of these problem areas uh, in the lab or do some customer interviews and really get qualitative data on what is the problem here so we can get to the bottom of it. But the, the survey can help us to figure out if there is a there there to begin exactly. with. Exactly. It really goes both ways, right? Uh, we have sort of a, I don't have it with me, a kind of graph that shows the, it, you know, we talk about qualitative and quantitative. Sometimes the quantitative shows an issue that is like, what's going on here? that then the qualitative helps you bring light to. Sometimes you have a qualitative observation going, we're not really collecting quantitative information on that problem. We didn't know that we should be doing that. And then it goes back to figure out how we can get that information at that quant level. And so there is sort of this back and forth that's always happening. And that's where the interesting, that tension and that back and forth is where the learning kind of really happens. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Carl, we are at the uh, end here. Um, thank you so much. This was uh, super fun to learn about and see those pictures from the lab was, uh, was just amazing. It's really All cool right. stuff that's happening right. there. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was, it was fun. Awesome. All right. All right. So um, before we leave, if you watch this on YouTube, remember to hit the subscribe button below. Um, we really uh, appreciate it. Uh, your viewership here and uh, feel free to share the video. Uh, next week is build. So we won't be doing this office hour uh, because of build. There will be so much more content coming uh, to channel nine and YouTube or wh wherever they're going to put it uh, that you're going to be so busy that you won't even have time for this anyway. So we're going to be starting up uh, after build. So the week after hopefully. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in and uh, See you next time.